Welcome everybody to the Metasploit Sprint demo meeting for September 5th. Well, let's take a look at some stats here. Um, we've had uh, quite a bit of activity over the last quarter uh, with the open pull request, and uh, so we're just looking back the last three months and uh, trying, trying, to, trying to keep that. We had a bubble up uh, a few weeks ago. We've, we've had, kind of brought that down and, you know, trying to, trying to keep it there. So keep fighting the good fight. Um, thanks to everybody who's been um, pulling stuff off the PRQ and offering reviews and helping land stuff. It's awesome. Yeah, a lot of great work, a lot of, a lot of code motion. There is, there is. And uh, here, if anybody uh, playing along at home, here's uh, the top committers for, for the last uh, month or so. Woohoo, uh, winner. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. And uh, Dave Maloney's hot on your heels though. I know. So a lot of, a lot of, but really, uh, <laughs> I'm only a hundred commits behind. <laughs> That's over a whole month. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's kind of funny. It's only 30 minutes a week. <laughs> so big thanks to everybody on this list here. We uh, really appreciate uh, your work and, and helping make Metasploit. Well, it's always been great. So I won't say great again. It's awesome. Um, Google Summer Code. Guess what? Evaluations deadline is today, and I, th I think we got all our evaluations in and one and done, right, Brent? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. So pencils down. Uh, final results, uh, according to their schedule, are supposed to be announced tomorrow. Hmm. Um, and uh, the, the the net gain of it for us was we got a lot of new uh, Metasploitable 3 and Linux payload improvements. Um, so we'd like to say thanks to, uh, obviously, to our students. I, I knew y'all would appreciate this goofy graphic. Uh, thanks to our, our, our Google Summer Code students. Uh, really appreciate their, their time and efforts. Uh, to the mentors uh, for their time uh, working with the students, uh, to Google for making it a thing we could participate in, and uh, thanks to Rapid7 for letting us participate. Yeah. Oh, man, what's nostalgia with that graphic? I mean, I, I'm pretty <laughs> sure my teacher had that like, oh, I, in elementary oh, yeah. school. I was yeah. about to say, Pierce missed his calling as an elementary school <laughs> teacher. <laughs> I've got gold stars for y'all to do demos later, so. All right, mm -hmm. awesome. Anyway, so that's so that's our first one done, right, Brent? For mm -hmm. First Google first one, code. hopefully, of many. I, I hear that Nextflows might be interested in, in doing some work for the next year, too. Oh, cool. I talked with the guys up in Toronto. Neat. Yeah. We'll get some traction with some other teams. That'd mm -hmm. be cool. Awesome. And let's see. All right, so let's talk about some things that have landed. Um, uh, the QNAP uh, NAS device, uh, we have a, a remote command execution uh, exploit for that. Mm -hmm. And we've got a get some module command execution exploit available uh, now, too. Yeah, that's a pretty cool one. It creates a, 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 a an evil Git repo, and when you check it out, it actually runs code uh, when you do a submodule update. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, and lots of people using Git these days. So mm -hmm. Good times. Um, Team Talk is an application that allows audio video conferencing, um, and we've got a credential gatherer for that uh, available. Uh, we also have stage interpreter support for the. Is it is it A Arch 64? So I've never actually said so, it. So I've only seen it written. Yeah, A Arch 64 sounds pretty reasonable to me. I wouldn't call it ah, Arch. Ah, like ah, but, but basically, the problem was a lot of configuration scripts for ARM things would look for like ARM star, and so they mm -hmm. called it ARM 64, which is that's the 64-bit version of ARM CPUs. That's right. Then it would it would have done a false match. So just the same way they skipped Windows 9. Um, so they wouldn't have false matches there. Or, yeah, uh, they yeah. skipped ARM 64 and called it ARC 64 instead. So yeah, so basically we run on 64-bit ARM processors now. You can do injection and you can do um, uh, you can create standalone ELF binaries that'll um, load a staged interpreter um, for ARM 64 systems. Um, that was really tricky because um, ARM 64 has some really neat um, security features. One of them is that the stack has to be 16 byte aligned at all times. Oh wow! Ooh. So uh, writing shell code for it is kind of awkward. Keep the keep it 16 byte aligned, huh? Yeah, <laughs> very cool. And we also, uh, in fact, you updated our, our router creds word list with a recent IoT creds leak. Right? Yeah, yeah. Someone basically trolled the internet, did a bunch of brute forcing, or didn't look like it took all that much work, but uh, but we just basically pulled in all the credentials that were leaked on the internet on Pastebin. So fun stuff there. Yeah, right on. Pastebin for the win. Um, and in fact, we, quite a few PRs this go around were uh, fell into the bucket of usability improvements uh, or bug fixes. Uh, quite a few of them, so mm -hmm. a lot of good stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, let's see what's in the hopper. Uh, things in the works. Uh, named byte transports. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And channelless uh, packet pivot support. Um, in fact, I think maybe both of those are have landed to the payload metasploit payloads. A project, but not in framework yet. That's right. The payloads bits are already in tree, um, and those are looking pretty good. We had some merge issues with the other side, and I can talk about that a little bit during demo time. Okay, cool. Right on. Uh, drives tool, driver tools loader, which I believe is PR'd and just needs some love there. Um, PowerShell staging improvements and AV bypass. Uh, more database performance improvements, you know, coming down the pipe. 
Um, the hashed up fixes and wide arrest support. I think we've Dave, we've got a fix UPR to fix for like Windows Server 2016, right? That is correct. Uh, cool. Which ironically goes along the same lines of what uh, Brent was just talking about with Arch and Windows 9, in that uh, the, the main root cause of the problems with Windows 2016 support was that at the time I wrote domain hash dump, there was no such thing. So there's a case statement for like which OS it is, because depending on which OS, it does a different method to get the database file. And it just didn't have a case for 2016. So it was doing unpredictable things. And then there were a couple other bug fixes uh, that, that needed to happen there too. Uh, Rage LT Man tested it on, um, on his server 2016 domain controller in his personal lab and said that it worked. I'm just waiting for somebody who has uh, commit access to actually like sign off on it and land it. Very cool. Um, we've also got some uh, malware controller exploits uh, sitting in, in the PRQ. Uh, there's been some feedback going back and forth on them. Oh, we talked about those last night. It was pretty funny because one of the exploits um, injects some code into the malware controller, but then requires the user to, to click a button that pops up. And the question was whether that's a passive exploit or an aggressive that's, exploit. And you suggested the passive aggressive exploit. We need to create a passive stance. aggressive type of exploit. <laughs> so yeah, that, um, yeah. I saw, I saw that, that part, but I didn't follow the rest of it. That was nice. <laughs> I liked it just on the name, but yeah, that's good. The backstory makes sense. There's a couple other exploits that would fall into that category too. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we have some privileged escalation modules. Uh, one for one for Windows and one for uh, Oracle uh, DB, at least like version 11 of their Express database. I think. You gotta check that one out, right? I am. I got right. downloaded the the stuff from Oracle this weekend. Great so man, get it while it's hot. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know. <laughs> we, we, have, a lot. we have some Oracle systems in the lab. Oh, do we? And maybe maybe that'll make it even easier. Thank you. Um, some scanner modules too. Uh, I've got this one that goes and, and looks for Cisco devices that have Smart Install uh, running, and uh, another scanner module for um, Buildmaster um, program for doing I guess release checkouts. I think uh, maybe builds. Uh, I've looked it up and I've forgotten. So <laughs> um, and then we have this one uh, big effort that uh, Hoodie's hooking up uh, with. It's uh, for module documentation. Uh, going through and finding all the little ins and outs of grammar, spelling checks, misplaced commas, words that got, you know, double pasted by accident or whatnot. And so, you know, thank you, Hoodie, for that. Um, yeah, stuff. I think he's gone through like 600 modules so far. It's just been pretty much a huge epic, epic yeah, effort. Yeah, he has. Yeah, and he's, and he's still, he's still, I think he's still got mm -hmm. a, it's, it's something in the hundreds to go. Yeah, so, so thank you, Hoodie. And uh, lots more bug fixes, you know, as usual, make it better. All right, so we'll go around and talk about some team updates here. <laughs> uh, the A team, uh, these these team typically works on uh, like payload focused uh, kind of kind of stuff. Um, uh, so the driver tools extension we mentioned earlier. Uh, there is uh, using uh, ag updating aggregator for the Crypt TLV changes that went in mm -hmm. recently, right? Yeah. Yeah, and the named bytes and packet pivots uh, we mentioned um, uh, improvements to the command dispatcher. Yeah, Will's been doing a lot of like deep dive into the guts of the command dispatcher, making it more sane and making himself a little less sane. I was going to say, that sounds yeah. Bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. thank you, Will. Uh, <laughs> there's a capture uh, mix in rewrite. Yeah, I've too. got one that like deletes a thousand lines of code. Um, I haven't wow. PR'd it yet, but it's going to be pretty amazing. Wow. But, uh, but yeah, fixed up. I mostly just removed a bunch of methods that nothing ever used, but we, the only thing we did was just test them. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but it, it also it. it adds things like Windows 64-bit support, which it turns out hasn't worked ever. Oh wow! And things like that. That would so, be nice. Well, nice to have be working. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. And uh, Metasploitable three capture the flag. Yep. Yes. That's that's on the uh, the tail end of being uh, done for for the United Talk. So we're looking forward to seeing that. Right on. Good stuff. And let's see the Xanatos team. Um, much much is the the same push. Uh, SMB two file operations. I think we might have a day of some of that. Awesome. Um, more database optimizations. Uh, the Metasploit 5 uh, proof of concept interface is coming along. I think we saw that last time. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working bugs out of the metal extension loader work I've been doing. I can show some of that if we have time at the end. Um, we also, uh, Xantos also did the, the pro release this week, and um, uh, I'd like to say thanks to Jeffrey Martin for his work on getting a couple bugs in and um, fixed uh, and help with the release. I'd also like to uh, say that we had uh, a milestone for Ruby SMB this morning. We actually landed our first community pull request on the project. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah.
Yeah, keep them coming. Try That's a big deal. Yeah. I saw he put another one up today. Yeah, we've got yeah. another one up, and more will be coming from uh, our first contributor, Christoph uh, De La Fuente. Right on. Um, hopefully, I said I said his name correctly, but uh, he's been doing a bunch of the work on the SMB one read and write I/O operations for files and name types, uh, which takes that off our plate uh, so that we can work on the SMB2 side of it. And we're trying to keep the communication open bi-directionally so that you can see how we're doing things and uh, keep in sync that way. But hooray, we have a community contributor on our open source project. Nice, that's why we do it. Yeah, one of many, hopefully. Oh, it's time for demos. OK, great. <laughs> now that we've done that, uh, demo time. <laughs> okay, so uh, I thought I'd start off real quick by showing one of the example scripts here. So as we are doing each sort of like atomic uh, action uh, in Ruby SMB, we've been adding these um, these example scripts to kind of demonstrate the functionality, which is part of how I demo it. But I wanted to just take a quick second to show this is the example script that we're going to be using in today's demo for reading from a file in the remote share to show you that how little code is actually needed to make use of the library. Like this first bit up here is all just taking arguments from the command line. And so it's really just the bottom half here. And it's just creating a socket, flipping that into a dispatcher into the client, doing our negotiation, our authentication, then we connect to a tree. And then we tell it what down here at the bottom, what file to open. Uh, then we read it into read the data from that file into a variable, and in this particular case, we're uh, outputting it to the screen, and then actually closing the handle to the file over the network. Um, so it's compar comparative to the Rex SMB client, even even the one that's uh, uh, ironically named Simple Client. Yeah. This is a very tiny amount of code to get things done, which is uh, definitely one of our goals. So not a super complex demo. Here's our here's our share that we've seen before. Uh, so the first file we're going to look at is this short.txt, uh, which is this little test phrase in here to make sure that we're pulling everything correctly. And so if we run our example <coughs> script, we're telling the read file example script to connect to that server with those credentials, that the test share. And uh, the file we want to read is short.txt. <coughs> and well, it's got we've got some like basically debug messaging up here, but you can see the text is output uh, there at the bottom. So that's great. I mean, that's a one k. Well, actually, it's I think like a 108 byte file. Uh, that's really simple, right? To pull through a single. Uh, through a single packet, a single read requ uh, request response cycle. So I went out and found this test file that is a six meg or so uh, text file that is, among other things, like it looks like somebody appended a bunch of random data to it, and then accidentally their script appended itself to the end of the file, oh, ironically. Huh? Uh, but at the, at the very least, uh, it's an ebook of the complete collection of Sherlock Holmes cool. in here. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a hefty file. Um, specifically it's, yeah, 6.18 megs. So we're going to go ahead and do that same thing, but this time we're going to tell it we want to do, we want to read this whole big text file just to show that we can, and there's where you can see the, oh, wait and see. You can see there's script for some reason appended itself there. I, <laughs> it looks like they wrote a script to just append these random words on there to get the size up, and somehow it read itself. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> but you can see uh, it pretty much instantaneously still pulled that entire six meg file down. And uh, we can even actually get granular with this. Like Obviously, this is like the high level uh, client side, but if you wanted to read a specific byte range out of a file, you can actually do that by passing uh, the number of bytes and uh, offsets into the into the read method, and you can pull specific chunks out. 
So for these large files, all it does is just basically loops through and resets the offset and reads the next bit over and over and over until it's done. Um, when, you when you run this, let's say redirect it to a file, how long does it take? You this just command? I mean, Instead of print it on the screen, redirect it to a file so it doesn't... Well, I mean, just printing, even printing it to the screen, like you got latency on the, the share. It was instant on my okay. terminal. I mean, can, can you time it and then redirect it to dev null just, just to satisfy the, the performance heads in the room? Uh, <laughs> at some point. You don't have to do that. We can do it right later. Now. <laughs> um, uh, so last, uh, the last thing, um, suppose you've got a file that's not in the root directory of the share you're connected to. You can also... We've got our hello from dev text file here. It will also uh, read a relative path for the file name here, just to show that this still works also. So once you're connected to the share, you can read from any file. Uh, now this is working only with SMB2 currently, but as I said earlier in the meeting, uh, Christophe de la Fuente, our first community contributor, has been working on all the SMB1 uh, named file and name pipe read write operations and once I get him uh, familiar with the abstract the file abstraction model that we're going with he should uh, be able to submit working client side code for all of that um, once we have uh, read write and delete uh, fully working then the, the next step for Metasploit integration is we actually have to go back and take a look at DC RPC uh, originally, I had thought that we could just pass a named pipe abstraction into the DC RPC implementation we have existing in framework, and it would just use that as transport. But it turns out our DC RPC implementation actually makes calls back into the existing SMB code to like assemble its packets. So we're going to have to figure out um, some form of of next step for that. It may be just creating, at the very least, a very limited DC RPC gem uh, on top of this to handle some of the basic operations that we need. Uh, so once we get the basic I.O. done for files and name pipes, the next step will probably be looking at starting with um, the enum shares DC RPC method that enumerates all of the available shares on SMB. That's where we're at. Lots of good progress. Nice update. Can you share the, the script? <clears throat> the, the example script? Yeah. It's in the uh, repo. It's, in the repo yeah. it's all in our open source repo. Okay. I, I encourage anyone who, who wants to achieve just some really beautiful code, especially from the testing point of view, uh, to check out the Ruby SMB. Um, it's pretty much almost like documents the whole protocol. If you just cool. read the code, you will actually understand how SMB works. Um, so it's pretty neat. Yeah, that's one of, that was one of my design goals. Um, like if I'll just show real quick. Uh, SMB2 packet, we'll do that. We'll take, if we take a look at the read request, you can see this is, this is what a read request packet looks like. And everything's yard doc, um, and every packet type had the yard docs include a link back to the MSDN documentation uh, for that particular packet structure, field, whatever. Um, so one of one of the goals is for the library to be sort of document uh, documentation for the protocol as well as an implementation of the protocol. So nice. We make hoodie happy. Uh, so that's uh, <laughs> that's what I've got. Would it be right if I did cool. one quick demo? Absolutely. Quickie right. quickie. Uh, let me put you. Make myself here. a presenter. Oh, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Show my screen. You need me to. All right. There you go. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to steal a little bit of thunder from Louis. Um, he he uh, he he, uh, he worked a couple of sprints ago on uh, basically a rewrite of the uh, the Java Web Debug Java Debug Wire Protocol um, exploit, which basically it's it's really it's not really an exploit in the sense that there's a vulnerability. It's more like an exploit in the sense that someone designed a protocol that lets you run arbitrary code within a Java program. Um, <laughs> it's on purpose. Um, so. Um, one of the things here is, um, uh, so I've basically what I've got here is a very simple Java program that I'm going to um, run, and all it does is just 
nothing, basically just prints things on the screen. Um, but you can basically set a command line option that turns on the Java debug wire protocol for debugging, which uh, if you have developers, they might do this occasionally and then leave it on and then you basically open up a nice hole into your remote application, um, unauthenticated and everything else. So that guy's running. I'm going to go ahead and um, show you a funny little bug we, we ran into while we were actually testing this PR. Um, so let me go ahead and run that exploit. Start, start, start. And just like a good good uh, TV cook, I've already got the uh, exploit already configured to exploit the machine. So I'm going to go ahead and hit run. And you can see here what it basically does is it drops a payload and then it never exits. And you're like, what's going on? Why, why? It looks like I got an interpreter session. That's great. It looks like it worked, but the payload's now hung and, and nothing's happening. Well, it turns out what actually was happening here, something that's actually been affecting Metasploit for a few years, um, maybe longer. I just didn't go back far enough in history to figure it out. But basically, um, whenever an exploit runs, it can register things to happen when the session connects. Like, for instance, if you use the file dropper, you can tell the system to automatically delete the file once you get a session to clean up the evidence that the thing existed. The problem was that there was no sequencing between those commands and the normal setup interpreter commands. So when a interpreter session connects back, it might also need to load standard API, it might need to do a whole bunch of other queries and that sort of stuff. And so basically everything's out of order and there's no actually no ordering enforced within Metasploit. Um, we recently pushed in a fix to it um, and that worked for a while by basically just reordering the code, <laughs> not a big problem. But uh, with the new uh, named pipe stuff, what we've added is basically this concept of a bootstrap function. What that basically means is, um, Sometimes we might have to set up a interpreter that never connected to us in the first place, especially when you've got one that's, that's pivoting through another interpreter session. So there's no actual new connection coming in. Instead, you've just got suddenly a new thing's talking to you and you need to send it, you know, extra bootstrap commands. So that led us to like kind of a funny situation where if we do a git grep def bootstrap, das bootstrap? Das bootstrap. This is the, basically the way that interpreters get set up now. Um, so basically, inside the bootstrap command, you basically, when a new interpreter is noticed, not necessarily connected to you, then you basically do all the things like loading standard API, turning on the encryption, all that kind of stuff. And so then the question was, now with this new, this new code for bootstrapping, how do we make sure that the bootstrap happens before all the on-session callbacks happen? Because now they happen, again, asynchronously. You can see here, there's actually a Ruby proc that runs it asynchronously. It's kind of secret here, but you can see it right here basically running it in the background. So you have a mixture of things running in the background and in the foreground. Well, the solution um, I kind of came up with for this is, get check out, oh, my paste buffer is empty. Get check out land a 18 pivot bridge. It basically looks like this, and it's a little bit funky. Um, we're still kind of figuring it out. But basically, what we did was we extended Bootstrap so that um, rather than being something that um, just simply sets up interpreter, it takes a handler as an argument. So basically, you can ask the handler, "What are the things that someone registered with you um, ahead of time?" So that in the Bootstrap, once the Bootstrap is finished, it can basically go back and call into the handler. So it's a little bit of a layering violation. It's kind of a circular layer thing where the handler talks to the bootstrap code that's in the client, but then the client is also managed by the handler. Um, another way to solve it may have been to uh, pass like a proc in that, that gets executed on, on the finishing of bootstrap. But basically, the, the state of the situ situation we have right now is we have a, a, a fork between um, command line sessions, which are available immediately, and interpreter sessions, which of course have to be bootstrapped, and then we basically pass a, a handle to the handler so the interpreter session can handle the handler itself synchronously. It's sort of a delicate pattern. But, but the nice thing about it is, and this, this we'll just wrap this up from a demo point of view, is that... Because um, it works. <laughs> it works. <laughs> that would be nice. Oh, there Does you it go. Go. <laughs> That's all we need right there. Oh, except for the syntax error that I just put in there. Um, but if, if there hadn't been a syntax error, um, it would have totally worked. Um, but so it was, a race, it was a race condition before. Now it's something different. Here, I'll, I'll do it one more time. Um, before it was a race condition. And in fact, I found two other race conditions. They're in the mm -hmm. same area mm -hmm. where um, there's other things that can be registered mm -hmm. um, to run against the session when it connects. And all those things basically need to be serialized okay. because they were sort of added over time. 
and from various points. From serializing various uh, basically callbacks. Yeah, serializing callbacks so that the callbacks run it in the right sequence rather than mm -hmm. just being everyone sort of opens up the floodgates and says, hey, let's all <laughs> send interpreters things right. to do. I make um, a but, joke about your race conditions, but my timing is terrible. Uh, so, so anyway, now you can see once everything is actually sequenced, you can see here now we yeah. actually set up the interpreter session first, and then we delete the file, and then you can actually interact with the session. Uh, nice. There you go. Uh -huh. Ta-da! Yeah. Nice. Weird cool. problem becoming less weird over time. Yeah. Very cool. Well, is, and where is that in respect to? Is that a PR waiting to be committed, or is that committed? So we fixed it once. Okay. And now we're fixing it a second time because of some refactoring meant that we had to completely rethink how we fixed it. Oh, okay, okay. So this is coming down the pipe. It's, uh, it's, not... it, it's in the pipe. It's it's on both ends of the pipe. Okay. And there's like <laughs> there's this big greasy clog right in the middle that we're, we're working on. <laughs> So you can add on top of a Luis checking? Or? We've already done that part. Okay. And then we're going to add it on top of the name pi PR as okay. well. Okay. All right. Very cool. Nice. I think that's it. Thank you, Brent. Thank you. Thanks, well, guys. Is, yeah, we thank reached, you. reached the end of our meeting time. Um, so I want to thank everybody for demos. Thank you. Thank you.